Hi, I'm Ty Kelly with Beaver Coach Sales. And I'm Sean Lake, an operations manager at Beaver Coach Sales and Service. We're here today to finish up on a, uh, I guess, a follow-up to what Sean and Ryan had going a couple weeks ago. Uh, we have a list of questions, probably the more common questions that clients come up with, uh, both calling in over the phone around the country and uh, out here in our service department. And I believe where we left off is uh, we want to talk about slide outs and slide seals. Uh, and one of the questions we have here is, how do you remove snow from the slide outs without causing any damage? That's a good question. So first of all, you just want to make sure that you're safe. Uh, you know, that your, your ladder that you're setting up, it's going to be cold outside and slippery. You want to make sure you have a nice firm foundation for your ladder and it's not rickety before you climb up it. Then secondly, once you do get up there, you know, most coaches have some type of a top running over the top of the slide box and the materials that they're made out of can become pretty brittle when it gets cold outside you know extreme cold it, it turns almost rigid and so you, you got to be really careful when you're sweeping them off if you if you strike them with something even as soft as a broom sometimes they'll crack or shatter knock a hole in your awning which is is no fun and can cost hundreds of dollars to repair and then I just usually start in the middle and just work my way to one side and then from the middle to the other side and then once you've cleared the snow off then the awning canvas can can roll up properly if you don't have uh, an awning over the top of your slide box just kind of the same thing and what you're doing is you're ensuring that you're not dragging a whole bunch of snow into the coach when you bring your slide box in is what you'll get is if you're driving down the road the first time you go and hit the brakes is you'll get you know 60 pounds of ice cold slush down the back of your neck and uh, nobody's gonna have a fun day doing that so Basically, you just got to be careful first. Make sure you, you clean it completely before you attempt to run the slide box. And, and so that's pretty much it for snow. Now, I'm, I'm envisioning the guy that, uh, that says, honey, you watch out the door. I'm going to run this thing in a couple of inches at a time and, and see if the snow just falls right off. It almost never does. So that's it, not Yeah, good, I mean, okay. you can try it. If it's really powdery. I, I have. Yeah, <laughs> if it's oh. really powdery snow, you might get away with that. But if it's heated up at all, usually, you know, a lot of motorhomes aren't the most well insulated uh, domicile. So you get a little bit of heat escaping. And the, so that gets trapped in between that roof space and the awning. And then you get a little sheet of ice. And that, that canvas doesn't like to roll up on itself. And to, to get a canvas to double in size, you really only have to add its thing thickness you know to the surface of the canvas so you can cause some damage or lock your slide box up or there you go don't try that again yeah don't do it again okay what about lubricants for slide outs do you, do you need to use anything so basic maintenance for a slide box i mean it's it's not super complicated stuff depending on the mechanism some of the mechanisms are a little bit more complex but for your basic rack type slide system that pushes and pulls from the bottom with either a motor or hydraulic you just want to make sure that you are lubricating any gear type mechanisms just hit them with some white lithium grease it won't attract a lot of dirt it, st it has some st some staying power and that it's not going to just drip off or dissipate or you know evaporate uh, so that's what we tend to use the most of. Uh, electric types will almost always have some type of a rack system, hydraulic the same, timing gears on both ends. If you have, say, like a Schwintech mechanism, there's really not a whole lot of lubrication involved. You just want to inspect them occasionally to see if there's any signs of strange wear that would maybe indicate something's come loose or something is out of alignment. Um, some of the HWH type, the lateral arm slides where the mechanism is bolted to either side of the box. Uh, there's a bunch of Teflon rollers in there, you know, lubricating those with light, white lithium grease will keep them from rattling. Also it'll keep them running smoothly. Uh, just basic stuff like that. Uh, cleaning the slide seals. Uh, you don't need to go through any extreme uh, measures. Just uh, soapy water on like a microfiber towel or a rag. Uh, you can wipe them off. There's There are products out there that you can spray on them. I mean, the, the effect is negligible. I can't really say for one way or another if it extends the life or not. Usually the slide seals uh, succumb to the sun long before, um, you know, any of those things would really protect them or they get torn uh, physically damaged so just keeping them clean keeping the sides of the slide boxes clean uh, is important and then lubricating the, the actual parts of the mechanism that make it extend and retract I have one more slide question here <clears throat> can you drive your RV with the slides out you can probably once and it's <laughs> 
you know, pedestrians beware, oncoming traffic, that kind of thing. I mean, if you ha- if, if your coach was disabled and say you had to move it a very short distance, like, I mean, like hundreds of feet, not hundreds of yards or, or miles. Um, yeah, you can, you can drive it with the slide box out uh, just to roll it from one bay to another. We do that sometimes if we have to. Uh, customers will come in and they have issues that would not allow us to get them either uh, all the way retracted. And so we'll, we'll move them like that occasionally, but we, we try not to as a rule. Just it, it obstructs your view out of your mirrors, uh, for one. And for two, the slide boxes now are, are so much bigger and deeper than they used to be. You're almost doubling the width of your, your coach. And so, you know, most people don't have the situational awareness to, to maneuver something like that through close quarters. So just be really careful and use spotters if you have to do something like that. And it takes multiple spotters when you do that. Because oh, yeah. It's amazing how, how poor your visibility really is. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, let's go along to uh, engine oil changes. Uh, question here, can I change my oil myself? Yeah, yeah, you can. I, I think the biggest thing that uh, would probably keep somebody from wanting to change their own oil is now you have this massive amount of waste oil that you have to dispose of. You know, and usually if you're catching it in a large drain pan and then trying to pour it into small, you know, containers in order to transport it to a landfill or wherever you can to get rid of it, it just becomes a huge hassle. There's no real easy way to pour it into the smaller containers, you know, uh, things of that nature. So yes, you can it's dirty and you know i don't know if it, who's had diesel uh used diesel oil on them but it's not like engine oil where you just wipe it off it's got a lot of uh, carbon in it it's it, it's you know black as night and it won't come off your skin and if you get it on your clothes they're basically ruined so yeah it's it it you can do it but you might as well let the guys the grease monkeys in the pit you know change your oil for you uh and when you come in here and see what they look like, you'll know why you don't want to do it. Because right. they, they can't ever get clean. They'll never get clean. Uh, yeah. When I was a chassis guy, and that's what I did pretty much every day, I had a permanent black ring around my bathtub at home. And yeah. Yeah, it's not very much appreciated. <laughs> so, okay, so you someone does want to change their own oil. What's different about RV oil, and, and where do you get it? There's nothing really different. There are just, uh, you know, the ratings that manufacturers recommend for certain engines. And it, as long as the oil meets their specifications, you can you can use whatever you want. You can use synthetic if you want. You can use conventional uh, that meets like the diesel turbo specifications like Rotella and Dello and stuff like that. Um, I think kind of the big biggest argument out, out there is like, how often do you change your oil? Um, because when an engine manufacturer, when they build a, a manual, say, for a particular engine, they're basing a lot of their calculations off like a truck driver because the majority of their engines go into these short and long haul trucks. And so everything is a, a fairly high mileage count or annually. It, everything will say, you know, or annually, you know, check your trans, change your transmission fluid. Uh, every 50,000 miles or annually. Um, what has the technological advancements have extended the life of the oil when it used to be that the initial function of an oil change, your very first oil change, whether it be your differential transmission or engine, was primarily to remove all of the metal shavings that were left over during the milling process and get those immediately removed from from the engine transmission or differential so that they didn't go on to cause uh, wear problems you know later on now with the the technology involved everything that is milled and machined it has such tight tolerances that we unless there's a major problem in fitment or you know a a torque setting or a bearing that goes bad or something of that nature you don't see a lot of those metallics coming back out of the pans like we used to and so because of that the the intervals for oil changes on those items have increased dramatically i know that uh cummins if you look at uh, one of their programs in their book, it, your initial oil change is at like 25,000 miles. And then if you go through their program, you send in oil samples and, and stay up on it, mm-hmm. it, you can extend it even beyond that. Now, the average person, a motor homeowner, isn't gonna drive their coach 25,000 miles uh, in a year. So then you kind of fall into the or annual uh, category. So that's kind of up to the discretion of the owner. 
you know it's it they're different engine manufacturers and even different engines in the same manufacturer might have different oil change intervals and as well as the the difference in fluids whether you're using a synthetic uh, versus a conventional oil as well okay now this next question uh, i'd like to know who this was because i want to maybe not take his motorhome in on trade he wants to know if do i need to change the oil in my generator Oh yes, um, uh, initial oil change on a generator can be between 25 and 100 hours depending on the manufacturer. Uh, you definitely need to be servicing your generator. When we see a catastrophic failure uh, of a, a component on the, you know, the, the engine side of a generator, it's usually due to lack of maintenance. There are different maintenance intervals uh, and for each generator, and, and each one of those has a specific amount of hours that you're supposed to address those issues. They have one that's you know right at about 1,000 or 1,500 hours, and that's really important because you're doing things like setting the valve lash, changing the thermostat, belts and hoses can get soft, uh, things of that nature. So you definitely want to uh, keep up on the generator maintenance. It's one of those things that... There really is no substitute. If it goes down in the field, there's really nothing that you can do short of plugging into you know, 50 amp service to uh, do the same job as the Jenny. What's interesting, uh, walking through the shop, uh, I, you see this in generators aren't that big, but you see them tore apart and I'll ask, what are you guys doing? Uh, doing a thousand hour service on a generator. It's a major deal. It's I mean, a pretty it's, big deal. That thing is tore apart. It physically has to be removed from the unit in pretty much every case because the manufacturers, the motorhomes, don't give enough room on their slide out trays, if they slide out at all, to get the generator out far enough to get all of the access panels off of it to get a deep enough dive into it to get to all the components. So, okay. yeah, it's a big deal. Okay, so now we're going to jump into, I, I guess it kind of goes along with oil changes. Uh, how long do the filters last? Uh, so I suppose that would be kind of go right along with your oil change, huh? Yeah, if, if you're changing the oil, you're generally changing the oil filter. Uh, if you're changing the oil filter, it's probably not a bad idea to get the secondary fuel filter as well. That's what catches the smaller particulates that are going to directly wear on uh, like the it, and the eject injector needles and seats. Basically what it is, is you got to imagine that that fuel is being pushed into that cylinder at thousands of pounds per square inch. Any sediment or anything that's solid that's mixed in with that fuel acts as an abrasive. And basically what it does is it wears the needles and seats out. And that's what makes an injector bad when an injector won't shut off completely. Uh, it, and that's what causes the, the fuel pressure bleed down too. So hard starts, things like that, they, they are directly related to the injector wear. So you know, changing that filter, the primary fuel filter, I mean, kind of a good rule of thumb is, you know, every other oil change, um, you'll see um, sediment in the bowl or water. If there's water in the bowl on almost every one of those uh, primary fuel filters, there's a mechanism to relieve it, whether it be a little twisty valve or a button you push and it, it pumps fuel through the system and opens a valve and lets the water escape. How many filters are there? Because you, you, don't you have at least one on the transmission too? Oh, you got, yeah, on an Allison transmission, there's two internal filters uh, on the, the types of Allisons that we mostly deal with. Engines can have one or two uh, oil filters. The fuel system will have almost always at least two. You have a primary, which is basically to catch water and the large pieces of sediment, and then it moves to the secondary, and then that picks up all the little stuff. Um, like your Aqua Hot's got at least one filter. Usually, you know, they'll have two. Oh, geez. Uh, cooling system, your engine cooling system. Usually, you'll have a filter. Your hydraulic system typically will have at least one filter. Um, yeah, so, and the air cleaner for the generator, and the air cleaner for the engine, and the fuel filter for the generator. So, yeah, it's, it's quite a bit. There was a question about uh, do RVs have cabin filters like your car has? Uh, some of the the RVs that are built off of an automotive chassis, then they have cabin filters just like their automotive counterparts. Uh, the larger, you know, uh, Class A diesel type motorhomes, uh, generally speaking, they don't have a cabin uh, like a air filter for the dash air conditioning and heating. What about uh, uh, the last filter question? Is you live on a really dusty, dirty uh, gravel road and 
is it easier easy to change an RV uh, air filter as it is like in a car? In some cases, changing uh, air filter on an RV is extremely easy. Uh, in some cases, it is extremely difficult. It just kind of depends on whether the engineer sat down and thought about the guy that comes behind him and has to service it. Uh, air cleaner can be, I remember the old Donis Donaldson's on the Gillig chassis was about a two minute replacement. There was four little plastic wing nuts that you would remove. <laughs> the base would come off filter comes out new filter goes in mm -hmm. on some of these units you're pulling brackets you're pulling u-bolts you're moving hoses and stuff around to get access and they so. can be monstrous they can be <coughs> huge oh yeah they can be 25 pounds and yeah. and you know three feet long so just kind of depends on the unit okay uh, hopefully that covers all the filter questions um kind of back to awnings again we talked about slide outs and topper awnings um what about removing stains from your awnings? Is there an easy way to do that? There's, you get sap and pitch and, you know, just stuff out there in the RV parks. There's basically two different kinds of awning canvas. One is like a tarpaulin material. It's a, a poly. And then the other one is like this umbrella type material, which is a, um, kind of more like a fabric, like a canvas. And so the, the stuff that's more like a tarpaulin material, well, it doesn't t gen generally tend to last as long. The sun's a little bit harder on that stuff. It's not as pretty. That's why it, you, on the higher end coaches, they usually will use the more canvas stuff. Um, so yeah, you, cleaning it. I mean, you can use things like Goo Gone and you know uh, a, a citrus-based remover for mm -hmm. like if it's if, usually there's two types of stains. One's going to be water soluble, and then the other one is going to be an oil base, something like uh, pine tar or something like that. If you park under a tree. And so that kind of stuff is your goo gone or your citrus cleaners that that'll break down the the tars and allow you to remove them if it's something like mold or whatnot depending on the severity of it there are a lot of different aftermarket cleaners that you know carpet cleaners and upholstery cleaners that you can apply to those that'll that'll colored awning i wouldn't recommend anything like i know some people use like a baking soda and peroxide mixture stuff like that that'll tend to bleach the fabric and leave a big unsightly stain where you know you were trying to address the stain in the first place so i'd say you know read the bottle and and see if it says anything about you know color fast fabrics and bleaching and, well one of the things we started an entire uh, upholstery department just because we stitched so many awnings. We sent all these awnings out to be restitched and, and brought them back. And just the labor of delivering them across town to have them restitched, brought back, uh, we found it to be uh, easier to do in house. So we that's kind of what got our upholstery department going. Is there is there one fabric that's better than the other for staying together? Is it the thread that's used? A lot of it is the thread. A, a ton of it is the thread. And you would think that at some of these companies that have been in business for a really long time. Um, I don't know if it's an expense issue or if it's just, you know, they don't uh, invest a lot of time in research and development, but there are a lot of uh, uh, issues that arise from just having the thread get eaten by the sun. It gets so dry that you can just pluck it apart with your fingers. And it does seem like the manufacturers are now catching on because if you look at a lot of their new fabrics, their heat seam sealed mm -hmm. and they have no stitching on them whatsoever. And, and I think that that was a big issue for them probably on uh, warranty units. You know, if you live in a place like Arizona or California or New Mexico where you're getting a lot of heat and a lot yeah. of sun, uh, it's just basically annihilating all of the stitching on the awning canvases. Okay. So yeah, well, we, we use a good quality fabric and then we did our research and we came up with a really good quality uh, thread and that will uh, fight, you know, the effects of the UV on the, on the thread. And then we build our own awnings uh, instead of trying to repair them because inherently what happens is you restitch the awning and six months goes by and it rips again. And then, you know, you have an angry customer because they just paid a lot of money to get their awning repaired. And it's hard to guarantee how long something like that'll last. Whereas for, pretty close you know similar money uh just the the extra cost of the fabric we can install a brand new awning right next door we have our upholstery shop and uh it looks like a sail making shop in there it's a big table with a sewing machine in the middle and we do stitch a lot of awnings so uh if you have that problem we certainly have the fix um de debris build up on your awning H how important is it to get it off of there versus just letting it go in and out or affect the the awning 
Oh, definitely it, anything that is left on top of the awning that will eventually get maybe perhaps wrapped up in the awning, it, it'll increase the size of the roll exponentially as it rolls up. And so you end up damaging things. You jam the awning roll, you know, in its little metal housing, uh, things of that nature. If it's a biological thing like leaves or whatever, it you know, that'll rot. And in the process of rotting the leaves, it's also going to rot your canvas. So you definitely want to make sure that before you retract your awning, sit there as clean as you can get them okay um, now the wind you know we see these awnings flapping out here in the breeze and uh, if, if you're out camping and you know it's gonna be windy uh, at what point should I you know, bring my awning in or run my slide in so my toppers don't uh, have a problem What's your thoughts on that? The, the toppers are pretty short. They don't catch as much air as the patio awnings. Um, so I would definitely say that if you're experiencing wind and you see that awning buffeting outside, if it's moving up and down, most of the awnings, uh, if you have the feature engaged, if it's an option, uh, have a wind sensor. And so once the awning moves, you know, so many degrees and so many seconds, it's an accelerometer that I believe that Gerard uses and some of the other companies use now, where they used to use an anemometer, which was, you know, the little whirly gig on the roof that was always missing mm -hmm. one cup. So it was more like <laughs> yeah. a wind direction monitor. Um, so they don't work if you don't have all the cups. So don't rely on that <laughs> that little sensor if you don't have all the cups on. You don't, with one cup, you just don't multiply by three? No, it, yeah, it's pretty much oh. zero rotation at that point, oh. and no matter how fast the wind is. So yeah, definitely retract your patio awning. Uh, we have seen in our own parking lot, you know, little micro bursts where you get a 45 mile an hour burst. That little mechanism, it can't react uh, fast enough to draw the awning in and it'll it'll take an awning all the way to the other side of a motorhome. We've seen it happen. So if you, if you anticipate high winds, definitely don't leave your rig unattended with the awning out. Uh, at least if you're there, you can make an attempt to bring it back in. If you're gonna leave and go to dinner or lunch or something or go play golf run your awning in yeah. for sure the slide boxes you know uh, i think the biggest thing with them is if you're expecting like an ice storm or something like that or or super high winds in excess of 50 60 miles an hour and you don't need the extra space probably wouldn't be a bad idea to bring them in uh you can hear them out there fluttering in the yeah. breeze they'll get stretched out the seams will tear and yeah, yeah. okay all right, let's move on to tow vehicles. Um, can you charge your RV battery from your tow vehicle? I'm assuming that must be a pickup pulling a, a tow behind, not a, not a motorhome pulling a... Uh, I mean, if you're towing a trailer and your tow vehicle is rigged with a charge wire and you're towing your trailer is also rigged with a charge wire then the answer is yes that's yeah. that's something that that is specific and even if you have like a six or seven way plug on the back of your vehicle doesn't necessarily mean that there's a charge wire uh ran to the back bumper same with like your towing vehicle and so if you're in a motor home and you have a little towed little car dinghy um but a charge wire is not necessarily installed from the factory you want to check and make sure that you have a charge wire you may on some units you may not even need it because when you shut the key off it kills everything in the car and so in some of these units when you tow them you have to tow them in the key in the accessory position or in the on position and so then you do have systems in the car that are active. So if you don't want to arrive at your destination with a dead tow car, then you definitely want to have a charge wire uh, installed. And in the process, you want them to put a diode in as well, because when you shut off your, your coach, you don't want your coach to draw off your tow car and kill the battery in it. It's very common to have folks come in here that they've towed their car in and their tow car is dead. We see it way more than you would think. So oh, yeah. I'm actually surprised how many people have that problem. And I've actually traveled with people that have to stop every so often and start their car and charge it. So that is a really important thing. Uh, how about, can you back up with your tow car on? I can't, because I'm not that good, but I've heard I just told a story where it. I did it. <laughs> now, I've only tried it one time and it was successful. We were in the middle of Kansas and uh, there was a Dairy Queen there that we hadn't seen an exit for a long time. And I really wanted to go to this Dairy Queen and a guy pulled in with a big boat next to me and, and uh, we were stuck when we came out and I had to back up about 50 feet. And so I watched in the backup camera, fortunately on these newer coaches, the backup cameras are awesome. 
and I watched the steering wheel and the tow car as I backed up and it did not move. But I do know, I've seen it done, uh, where you start to back up and once that steering wheel starts to go, it goes really fast and it can be a mess quick. So uh, what we will tell you is don't back up with a tow car on. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, does towing a vehicle behind an RV shorten its life? <sighs> I, it's kind of a, that's kind of a uh, an interesting question because while there are certain systems in the car that are being used there are others that are not some tow vehicles won't even log miles being towed behind uh, an rv so i would say that the wear items that you would experience when it's being towed behind your rv would be bearings if you have a supplemental braking system, obviously you're going to be using your brakes. Um, anything, basically anything that's, that's turning going down the road. Your, yeah, your tires. Um, but other than that, um, not really. Uh, driving a, a car, you know, obviously you're running the engine, you're using the transmission, you're exercising, uh, you know, the differentials. You're still the differential's still turning, uh, even on your on your towed vehicle. If you're not you know, going down the road with the engine running if it's towed behind. So yeah, it doesn't hurt anything. Uh, I would just say that you maintain your normal service schedule on your towed vehicle and just treat it like it was running. So, you know, if you've towed that thing for 80,000 miles and at 80,000 miles it requires a differential service and I'd go ahead and service a differential, don't assume just because it's, you know, not being ran, that it's not being worn. Unless you're putting it on a trailer, you know, obviously then uh, you're not accruing any of that damage, but. One thing I noticed, we tow a Jeep Wrangler and uh, it, it tows with the key off, you know, it's in park, neutral, park, key off. Uh, but when I tow it for hours and you get out and start it up and put it in gear, it smells really hot, like something's hot in there, maybe one of the fluids. Could be, could be uh, differential, it could be could be brakes if you're if you've used the supplemental braking system okay yeah i've often wondered what that was because it's uh smells warmer than normal so it, it probably is a, i suppose all that stuff's turning so um anyway uh yeah obviously tires that's that's going to be a big thing yep. i think my car has been towed more miles than it's been driven and i think that's true with a lot of our viewers you know we have our tow cars and that's all we really use them for um, let's see, I think that's really it for the tow vehicles. Anything you need to add? Anything special about tow vehicles we need to know? It's just, there's just a, there are a, a lot of different braking systems and tow package um, components out available out there from a multitude of different manufacturers. I would just say that if you're tempted to install some of those components cool. that yourself, uh, I would seek, you know, some kind of guidance, whether it be from the manufacturer or whatnot. We see constantly uh, issues with, you know, braking systems that are, you know, misinstalled, miswired um, hardware uh, where brackets are bolted to chassis that aren't properly torqued or they don't have Loctite on them. They haven't been maybe, maybe you know, doing a little pre uh, game checklist on your tow vehicle isn't a bad idea stick your head under there and actually physically look at the bracket and make sure that the holes are not becoming oblonged we've had a couple units in here where the front end of the frame extension you know it's like a unibody type thing so it's basically hardened sheet metal and it wobbled the holes out and then the bracket ended up ripping completely out of the frame mm. extension that's that's happened uh, enough times that it bears bears mentioning for sure and we hear quite often uh, just because of the nature of our business and the amount of customers that come through here how many people have had tow cars detached from their motorhome and it, it's not as uncommon an occurrence as you think it would be and it can be catastrophic not only for the driver but oncoming traffic or just you know some bystander standing on the side of the road so Definitely stuff you want to pay attention to before you go out and haul your rig for hundreds of miles. Just make sure your gear's up to up to snuff. I have two experiences with that. One is when I first got in the business in mid '90s, a customer was just taking delivery of their new vehicle, and the stinger was in, and they put the pin through, but it didn't go through the hole. It went behind the stinger, so they had it all hooked up nice on this new tow car and and brand new tow bar behind the coach, 
And as they pulled out, the stinger came loose and it was down a hill and the tow car ran into the back of the coach. And just right out here, 10 years ago, I was with a customer riding with him and he hooked up his tow car. Uh, I was gonna go to his house to bring his coach back that he was trading in. And uh, his tow car came undone and we saw it in the mirror going, uh, passing us on the right. So that can be really interesting. Uh, so anyway, that's, I guess that's about all we have. If you have questions, send them in. We'll make sure we get to all of your questions. Uh, we really appreciate Sean coming and helping us out with this today. Uh, we didn't make it through all of these questions last time, but uh, we're excited to bring you uh, this opportunity more and more often. And as you have more questions, we'll just uh, keep this up and keep going. Thanks, Sean, for your time and uh, appreciate it. Oh, yeah, we'll see thanks. you next time. Thanks to all you guys for tuning in and watching, making it worthwhile. Appreciate it.